Well, good morning, Crossroads family. Welcome to this very exciting new frontier for our church to enjoy together. Let's begin by reading God's word, shall we? Listen to the Apostle Paul, Romans 1, beginning in verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. What is that all about? The Bible is revealing to us that all of creation speaks of our creator. You can't just take all of these things for granted like the devil wants us to. This world spinning on its axis, the, 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 the solar systems and galaxies, the universes as far as eternity can span Nothing about our life here is ordinary. You consider our, our human bodies, how they are fearfully and wonderfully made, how, how we're just interconnected, how, how we heal, how we reproduce. If you've ever watched your child being born and you think there's, there's not a God, well, you weren't even in the room. It's a supernatural experience. Now, many people like to say, well, I... I had natural childbirth, and I'd like to interject, and no, that was supernatural childbirth. We take all of these things for granted, and God is saying, look around. All of my creation proves that the creator, me, exists. That's the word of God. But people are acting godless. People are acting wicked. Have you watched the news? Do you see what's happening in the streets of our nation? What's happening across this planet? People are acting wicked, suppressing the truth of God by their wickedness. Welcome to the Revelator. It's a powerful name. It could be an action movie. I think it is. Welcome to the Revelator, this brand new series on the book of Revelation right here at Crossroads Church. Now, the Apostle John, also known as the Revelator, he was divinely enlightened. He was empowered from on high to write the book of Revelation. And he wrote this during, listen carefully, a very dark time in Christianity. Does that sound familiar? He wrote this book during a very dark time for the church. In fact, John received this revelation on an island called Patmos, which the, the Romans were using for a prison camp. That's right. The revelator, John, the apostle John, was actually imprisoned for preaching. He was serving time for preaching the gospel, and he received this revelation from on high during that period. So listen, before I say anything else, I know that these are tough times for the church, but nothing compared to the times that John was living in as he wrote these words for us, the church, quite optimistically, quite joyfully, in spite of his condition. We have uh, never experienced that level of Christian op oppression, that level of suppression, that level of full-out opposition against Christ and against the church. I'm sure that's coming next. Our nation is just falling farther and farther away from God. And that's why this series is so important. That's why this church and our, our devotion to God in church is so important. Because I am convinced with all of my heart, we are God's last great hope on this earth his bride. And he's expecting more from his bride than just to go along with the flow 
or to try to be uh, politically correct and just fit in at every opportunity. It's time for the church to truly take a stand in Jesus Christ and to stand out and to stand apart from the things that are destroying the future of this land. Now, the book of Revelation was most likely written just before the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70 AD. Now, some scholars argue it might have been a decade later, but I don't think that matters when it comes to the message. It's the same message if it's 70 or 80 or 92 AD. So let's just say this. Uh, About 40, perhaps 50 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, God gave this book. Now, also keep this in mind. When I say God gave this book, books as we know them uh, weren't invented yet. What we have here is a a patch quilt uh, of rolled up into a a scroll of parchment paper that was being smuggled piece by piece off of the island and into this now divinely canonized book of our Holy Bibles. This book, the book of Revelation, it's a prophetic revelation about the continuous and continual persecution and suffering of the church. Its purpose, however, was to give encouragement to Christians. So listen, nothing's changed. The purpose of this study, the purpose of this word, the purpose of this sermon is to give the church encouragement and to remind us to be faithful regardless of the times that we are facing, regardless of the oppression, suppression, and persecution. So John wrote about the times that were at hand, the times they were facing, and God gave him divine information to speak about the future. And many of those future, those those prophecies have yet to be revealed have yet to be fulfilled. So in other words, the book of Revelation was for the church back then in their dark time, and it's just as much for us today in these times. This is the living word of God. God's word is applicable. It is relevant all of the time because God is timeless. Yes? So again, the revelator, the apostle John, he was being greatly influenced in his writing, uh, in the natural, from the Antichrist sentiment that was blowing through Rome and Jerusalem. And I know we see a lot of Antichrist sentiment right here in America, but what he saw was, was even worse. He was in prison again for, for preaching this word. I'd like to say this uh, going in though. I'm pretty sure that John, the revelator, would not have been bothered by a little social distancing that we're complaining about when he wrote this from captivity in prison. I doubt if he'd be complaining about having church online this morning or worried about wearing a mask outside during a viral pandemic. In the midst of his great turmoil, in the midst of his great suffering, in the midst of Christianity, the leaders, the servants being executed He divinely penned this book, this book full of pastoral encouragement for the church. Amen? This is relevant. This is relevant to those who don't believe just as much as it is relevant to those of us who do believe. This book is intended to be used for for comfort, as a, an instrument of, of hope and reassurance. It's a reminder of all the things that we have to be excited about, all that we have to look forward to in our awesome Jesus. And the book of Revelation is also divinely designed to remind us to fixate less on the happenings of this world and instead to be preparing for the magnificent return of our Lord. And by the way, in case you don't know it, this book ends with a big bang. 
an apocalyptic conclusion that should make every one of us want to be an evangelist and to save as many people as possible. Personally, I don't think it's a coincidence at all that our great crusade has been postponed until after this pandemic. I think God's timing is right on time because people will be of a fresh mindset the next time we open that altar and invite them to receive Jesus Christ. Are you with me so far, church? Are you awake so far, church? The central theme of the book of Revelation, believe it or not, is Jesus. It's all about how awesome he is. It's about our omnipotent God and how he reigns and he reigns eternal. Now the word revelation translates from the Greek word apocalypsis. I think you might recognize that, apocalypsis. It literally means an unveiling or a disclosing or a reality that has yet to be seen. I like that. Apocalypsis, revelation, a reality that has yet to be seen. And I pray that this study series is just that for you guys, a reality that you haven't even thought about completely yet. An eye-opener about the reality that awaits this world. And most of all, the reality that awaits all of us who call Jesus our Lord. For all of us who call Jesus our Savior, this is a book of that reality. I pray this unveiling, that this revelation will bring all of this into focus for this church. How awesome, how holy, how amazing our God is and how desperate each of us need to be for him. We must be pursuing him with all that we are. And I pray that this book and this series ignites a new fire in each of us here at Crossroads Church and for all of our friends that join us by the thousands all over America in different countries. Praise God that you're watching. It's not a coincidence. It is not an accident. God's spirit, his Holy Spirit has brought us together right now for all of us to hear and share in this study. Yes, in church, if you really get this, if this series and this study of this word, this, this divine word really gets to you, and I'm praying that it does, you will be laying down your tongues and your weapons of this divisive world, and you're going to be sure that the light of Jesus Christ in your church the light of Jesus Christ in your household, the light of Jesus Christ in you is never, ever snuffed out. Are you worried about our future generation, generations? I have beautiful grandkids all over the place, and I watch how fast things have changed in America. They have changed so fast. I just said today that my father passed away eight months ago and he would not believe what's happened in the America that he fought for, what happened in the America that his dad fought for. The things have changed so drastically and dramatically for the worse in only eight months. I'm scared for our kids. I'm scared for our grandkids. We need to learn the lessons of revelation and truly apply them to ourselves, to our family, to this church, and invest in the future generations of the stewards, the ambassadors, the disciples of this message. Church, these are apocalyptic times. We're, we're being ushered into those end times Let's wake up. Let's wise up. Let's learn from this lesson and truly change it up. Amen? And amen. There's several lessons from the first three chapters of Revelation. One of the lessons is church attendance is critical for the Christian. 
There's a shocker. Church attendance is critical for the Christian and believers must stick to the doctrine. You're gonna hear more about that in the next couple of weeks. But one of the lessons from the first few chapters of the book of Revelation is Christians need to keep going to church. Now I know what you're thinking. Aha, I told you this was wrong. Watching on television, this is church because don't fall for this westernized this belief that church is about a building and dancing in the aisles of that building on Sunday mornings. That's just gravy. That's just an added bonus when we get to do that. King David did not need a building like this to dance in. He just danced before the Lord. You can dance before the Lord wherever you are right now. But listen carefully, we are the church. And we are assembled right now. We are assembled by the gift of God called modern technology, computers, the internet, these great cameras, these beautiful lights. We have all of these attributes, all of these gifts to use to reach you right there in your home as you sit on your nice furniture watching your big flat screen. We are assembled right now. When the Bible tells us to keep assembling, we're doing the right thing. And that's why I want you guys to keep gathering at 9 a.m. so we are all in the same place, spiritually, at the same time. Right now, wherever you are, we are assembled together by the same Spirit that saves us, God's Holy Spirit, leading us, indwelling us, delighting in us. I believe God is delighting in us right now because regardless of the opposition, we keep finding a way to keep this church together. And here we are. Church, listen carefully. Keep meeting. Keep meeting. It's, it's, it's biblical. Keep meeting on the internet. Keep meeting in the sanctuary once it's safe. And it will be safe again soon. Those who believe they can be good Christians, yet avoid worship, yet avoid the gathering, uh, the attending of a church service like this one, they have convinced themselves of something that is actually unbiblical. And I am praying that this series might help you uh, correct your path because that is one of God's obvious designs and intended purposes of the book of Revelation was to help the church, people like us, correct their path. So here we go. Are you ready? Roll up your sleeves of your bathrobe. <laughs> I'm dressed up. Why aren't you guys? That's the real question. Roll up your sleeves, get out your notepad, and get ready for a great experience for the next several weeks or several months, perhaps several years. Who knows how long this might take at the rate I'm going? But be ready, because here it comes. Revelation chapter 1, beginning in the ninth verse. I, John, the revelator, both your brother and companion in the tribulation, and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, again, I've already told you this, but as he wrote this, he was imprisoned on that island in prison for preaching the gospel. But notice how he, how he begins here. He said, I'm on the island not to suffer. He didn't say I'm on this island to be punished. He said, I'm on this island for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Not one time did he say, hey, this isn't fair. I was just serving God. This is not right. Nothing like that. I don't read of any marching. I don't read of any protesting. No, no rioting, no looting, no fires, no violence. Nobody hijacked the cop shop. <laughs> That's disgusting, by the way. I'm ashamed of our country for allowing that right now. But back to John the Revelator. He did nothing. He did none of those human things. All he said was, I am your brother and I am here, meaning I am here in captivity, meaning I am here in prison. I am here in isolation. I am here in the ultimate of social distancing. I am here for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's all he was there for. And he recognized that God had allowed him to be there to accomplish this goal. God had his undivided attention. So don't be shaking your fist at social distancing. God has, and he should have, our undivided attention. 
And perhaps round number one, enough of us weren't giving our attention to him. And so here we go on an increase, a spike. Church, give God your attention. (laughs) John was there to receive this word and to share it with us. He bore the record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, and he told us everything that he saw, and he saw some pretty wild stuff. Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Don't forget Pentecost. You know, just 40 years earlier or so, he was baptized in the Holy Ghost, and here he's telling us that he is in the spirit and he's revealing supernatural information from on high to share with us. Oh, and by the way, when John says here that uh, I'm in the spirit on the Lord's day, this is the first time in all of Christian literature that this day, our day, the first day of the week is called the Lord's day. It started right here. He's moving in the Holy Spirit on the Lord's day. I pray that we right now, we too are moving in the Holy Spirit on this Lord's day. I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. In other words, there is no one before me and there is no one after me because according to this word, God is God. I'm the beginning I am the end. There's nothing before me, nothing after me. I am the all in all. I am God. And what you see, God said, write in the book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, the trumpet, by the way, is God getting John's attention. He is, he is beckoning. He is summoning him to a monumental encounter with him. This trumpet sounds and indicates a great message from God is at hand in verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me. And having turned, listen carefully, I saw seven golden lampstands. That represents the churches. This represents the churches who are the light of the world. Keep that in mind as we go along. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, in the midst of the churches, I see one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet. That's the sign of royal priesthood (laughs) at the highest level. And girded about the chest with a golden band. And then John continues, as we see in verses 14 through 16, to show us his supernatural peak, his supernatural look at God. And he's using metaphorical terms. He's using earthly language to translate to us what he was privileged to see. He said that his, his head and his hair was white like wool white as snow, which represents dignity, represents wisdom. He said his eyes like a flame of fire. God has penetrating insight. His feet like fine brass. I looked that one up. Represents God's omnipotence. His voice like the sound of, of many waters. That's God's commanding authority he's trying to describe to us. He had in his right hand seven stars. Now, some theologians believe that he's referring to seven guardian angels over the seven churches in this discussion. Others believe he's referring to the pastors, the leaders of each of the churches. I've been praying about this. And right now in my spirit, I feel that God has me in his hand. That God has this church right now in his hand. and He is blessing us. So I believe with all of my heart that God's reminding us 
what it's like to be the church, and he's telling us that I have you, pastor. I have you, pastors. I have you, congregation. In these troubled waters, in these unprecedented times, making some of the most difficult decisions a pastor has had to make so far, and God is telling us, I have you in my hand. I'm with you, and you are with me. This is the divine word of God. Out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword. That means only one thing, divine judgment. Divine judgment comes from the mouth of God. You're saved or you're unsaved. You are welcomed in or you are cast out. There's nothing in between. That sword cuts one way or the other. And it's time for people who've seen God's attributes to live like they believe the creator created all of these things. Yes? His countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. God's countenance is like the sun shining in its strength. I've read that in heaven. We will need no other form, no other source of light or lighting because all light will come from the countenance of God. By the way, all of these descriptions are well-known Jewish metaphors and they always mean the exact same thing. Write this down. Tremendous power, tremendous authority. These are man's words. These are man-made attempts at trying to harness, trying to attempt to describe the glory of God. We can't do it. But John, moving in the spirit, did this, this divine thing for us to digest, to chew on, and to get excited about today. Back to Revelation 1, verse 17. And when I saw him, <laughs> what would you do? What would you do in John's position right here? When I saw him, I fell down by his feet like I was dead. <laughs> yes, please. That's where I'm going to. But he laid his right hand on me and he said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. In other words, don't be afraid. I am God. You understand this connection, Alpha Omega, first and last. I'm God, I am. Don't be afraid of me, I created you. Don't be afraid, John. I am, listen carefully, verse 18. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Now, hold on, right there, stop everything. For years, I've been showing you guys examples of proof that Jesus Christ is God, and there it is. Because John is having this, this great revelation. The revelator is, is talking to God, and God says, it's me, I'm God. I'm the creator. I'm the alpha, I'm the omega. I'm the first, I'm the last. And by the way, I'm the one who died and came back from the grave. <laughs> That's pretty exciting. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ to John the revelator. Jesus, a.k.a. the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the great the holy, the omnipotent, I am. I am he who lives and was dead, but behold, I am alive forevermore. <laughs> Pretty exciting stuff. Oh, and by the way, the word of God, amen. Bonus, I have the keys to Hades and to death. When Jesus took that beating. When Jesus took our blows on Calvary, when Jesus died, he went to hell and came back with the keys. He came back and he unlocked. Jesus came back to unlock our eternal prison cell. Christ took upon his death on our behalf. Listen carefully. This proves it. Absolute control. Absolute authority. Absolute domain over hell and over death. Jesus is our tree of life. Jesus is our eternal spring of living water. Amen? Jesus is our king of resurrection. God, our redeemer, our savior. Verse 19, write these things down which you've seen and the things which are and the things 
that will take place. In other words, there's three parts to this revelation. Write down things you know historically. Write down things you're going through right now in this experience and write down what I'm going to show you is going to happen in the future. The book of Revelation, historic information from John's natural eyes. Three divisions, three, three sections. They're not, they are not equally divided. Chapter one is about the past. Chapters two and three are about the present. And chapters four through 22, the exciting stuff, the stuff you've tuned in to hear about, <laughs> happen in chapters four through 22. Future information, prophetic information of things that are going to occur later. Revealed things that nobody has seen yet. Oh, the book of Revelation. It doesn't get much more exciting than this church. This book shows us the true Antichrist. This book shows us God's judgment. This book reveals the calamity that is on this earth. This book shows us the mystery Babylon in vivid detail. Stay tuned. And best of all, and I'm going to say this again and again. Best of all, this book reveals to us. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. If we focus on all of the other sensational aspects, which we like to do concerning the book of Revelation, we will miss Jesus. If you miss Jesus, you've actually missed the book of Revelation. Henry Blackaby a uh, great pastor and author, a man that I respect, he wrote this. He said, perhaps the greatest lesson we can ever learn from the book of Revelation is related to the identity of Christ. The more we know Jesus, the more we understand who he is, why he came to earth, and how he reigns throughout eternity. The better we know Jesus, the more we have a desire to praise him, worship and serve him and exalt him as being the only one worthy of our highest honor, glory, and praise. Now back to verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. Scripture is about to answer its own question. Are you ready? The Bible tells us the seven stars are the angels, translates to pastors, leaders as well, keep that in mind, of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands, which you saw, are these seven churches, which are called to be the light of the world. So again, God has the leadership of all of his churches in the palm of his hand. And you're going to have to... Uh, admit at some point along the way in this study, there are certain parts that are more complicated in the book of Revelation. Some parts that are easier to comprehend, some parts that need to, to prayerfully be considered and discerned. So for right now, let's focus on what we understand and trust God's Holy Spirit to divinely reveal all that we need to know as we need to know it. I trust him. How about you? Revelation chapter two, beginning in verse one. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write this. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. In other words, this is the word of God who's walking among you in the church and holding you up. I know your deeds, God's telling us the church. I know your hard work. I understand your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you have found them to be false. And you have persevered, have endured hardships for my name, and you have not grown weary. He must be talking to the pastors of the church. That's all I can tell you. Yet I hold this against you. You know, it was going so well. Those first three verses, amen, brother, amen, preach it, pastor, felt good. All of a sudden, verse four, 
God holding us to the refiner's fire. God holding our feet from the pastors all the way down to this congregation. We're all in this together. I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Whew. Every one of us has a testimony of coming to Christ and how awesome that felt and what a glorious occasion and all the things God revealed and all the excitement in our newfound freedom of recognizing that our cruddy pasts would no longer be counted against us. But as humans, like with everything else, we take the, the universe and the galaxies and the earth for granted. We take our bodies for granted. We take birth of babies for granted. We, we abort babies like they're a commodity, like they're, like they're a nuisance. We murder babies. We get used to all of this stuff. And just like that, in our flesh, we get used to our salvation. We get used to our relationship. It's just like falling in love with your spouse. If you're not careful, you can just become people who coexist, people who share a bed and just coexist and just go through life side by side, not even really connected any longer because the love you felt, that spark, it's not there anymore. And as a person who's counseled several marriages, I will tell all of us, you must work to keep that spark. In any relationship, it takes effort to keep, it, to keep it red hot, to keep it exciting. My wife and I, we work hard at our marriage to keep it blessed, to keep it fun, to keep it fulfilling, to be only satisfied by each other. It's taken 37 years of conversation, of effort, of changes being made. How about our relationship with God? We get saved we're all excited, brand new life, new creation. <clears throat> and we slowly drift away and God's telling us, you have all these things right, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had for me at first. It's not the same. We're not growing deeper and deeper in love. We're making excuses. Well, you know what? Church is on the internet. I can watch it back anytime. Let's go have some fun. Let's go have a picnic. Let's put everything before God. I used to do that. Boxing matches and football games and car shows. Everything was always more important with a good excuse. Well, it's family time. I'm blessing God by, by working on Sunday because I've got to pull my, my ox out of that well. I've said all these lies. And God is talking to the church. You've done all these things. You've persevered through all of these hardships, but I hold this one thing against you. You have forsaken the love you had for me at the start. That's the word of God. I can't say any more plainly than this. Verse five, God says, consider how far you have fallen. It's not too late, church, to pick ourselves back up to rededicate, to, to redevote our lives to Jesus Christ. Now more than ever is this necessary to survive these shark-infested waters that we call America. Life. God is warning us. Get your eyes back on me. Stop being so impressed by the world. Be impressed by the one who created the world. Yes, Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things that you used to do. I know God is speaking through this donkey right now for somebody watching this in TV, internet, social media land right now. Repent and do the things that you used to do. Come back to God. Come back to family prayer. Come back to godly thinking. Take the junk out of your life that has no place in your life or in your mind or in your home or on your computer or on your TV. Treat your wife the way God wants you to treat your wife. Treat your husband the way God wants you to treat your husband. Raise your kids the way God wants you to raise your kids. Kids, treat your parents the way God wants you to treat your parents. If you do not repent, 
I will come to your church and I'm going to remove your lampstand from its place. What does that mean? That means instant judgment. Instantaneous judgment. When God pulls his light from our midst, when God pulls his lampstand from his church, when God pulls his lampstand from our heart, from our home, there's no godly light left in us. And there's nothing left for us to live for, to aspire to be, or to share with anyone else. Just the darkness of this earth that will have snuffed out the glorious light of Christ in all of us who believe. And all of us compromise this relationship. All of us take things for granted. It's part of our flesh in this series. This book is a wake-up call. It's a reminder to the bride of Christ. It's a reminder to Crossroads Church. It's a reminder to your pastors, all of us. We do not want God to pull his light from within. We need to live for him. We need to rediscover the love that we had in the past. That loving relationship, that on fire, that red hot, that white hot relationship with him. He said in verse six, but you do have this in your favor. You hate the practices of those who are part of the pagan society, those who are living immoral lifestyles, idol worshipers. You don't like that stuff. Do you know why? And I'm convinced this is right. We as Christians know that those things are wrong. So we proclaim the right things. We claim to do the right things, but our hearts and our minds are slowly drifting more into the world and farther away from the things of God, including God himself. He's reminding us as, as we go through these weeks of, of discovery, right up front, God needs the church to know that it's time to come back to him. Because church, I'm convinced as I stand here, the things you're about to learn from the book of Revelation, you will not be able to handle unless you first return to Christ. That's where the glory is. That's where the victory is. That's where our safety is. That's where our hope is. If we go through this series apart from Christ, it will be a very hopeless journey for you. So right up front by God's design, it's time to return to Christ all the way back to the way it used to be when you first fell in love with him. That's the word of God. Amen and amen. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the spirit is saying to the church. To the one who is victorious, I will give you the right to eat from the tree of life, the passage church through Jesus Christ to eternal pleasures and fortunes and blessings. Jesus, after the fall of man in the garden, Jesus, again, he, he took that cross. He dove into the depths, into the bowels of Hades to gain control victory for us. And by his death, his burial, and his resurrection, we are hopeful people because his resurrection became our resurrection. Never stray. Church, listen, never stray from the only hand that saves you. A pastor named Sam Storms, he broke it down like this. He said, here's the themes of the book of Revelation in a nutshell. First of all, persecution is part of the Christian life. Second of all, God is sovereign. Third, Christ is king. Four, all things will culminate in Jesus. Five, the church will appear dead. For a time, according to the book of Revelation, the voice of the church will be silenced. The church will be barely noticeable. I feel like the church has been barely noticeable lately in the news. How about you guys? but the church will rise up in power. How? With people like us returning to our first love in Jesus. That's how the church will find that source of power all over again. And there's going to be a catalyst. This will be a great catalyst for a global harvest of souls. Return to our first love. 
Return to the way things used to be when we first discovered forgiveness, justification, God's grace. And let's start fresh from right there because this world needs people like us leading them away from the world and into the arms of Christ, their Savior. Point six about Revelation. Satan is a formidable yet defeated foe. That's quite profound. Our enemy is formidable but defeated. You need to know all about this to understand. Seven, Christians will be preserved by God. Our hope is in God. Eight, we cannot comprehend the great things that lie ahead. Nine, justice will be served. And 10, Christ is coming soon. You better get ready. Are you ready right now? Let's pray. Would you please stand to your feet? Act of worship. We lift your hands in this moment of prayer. Repeat after me. Jesus, I am coming home. <laughs> I am coming back into that red hot relationship we once had. Thank you, Lord, for reminding me, for reminding me to make this change in direction in my life, in my physical life, in my spiritual life. Thank you, Lord, for your patience. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your grace being applied to my transgressions right now. I am truly sorry for drifting away. I am the prodigal. I've come home and I thank you. I thank you for receiving me. I thank you, Lord, for welcoming me. I am your child. Holy Spirit, teach me how to live for you better how to serve you better, how to love you better. Give me spiritual eyes to see, ears to hear what you're teaching me from this great series called The Revelator. Thank you for revealing your truth to me today. I am a child of God. I am saved. I am redeemed. I am the redeemed of the Lord Jesus. And I am so glad. Thank you, God. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time as your prayer of forgiveness, as your prayer of salvation, it's called the sinner's prayer. If you just prayed that to receive Christ for the first time, will you please text the word saved to these numbers, one of these numbers right here on the bottom of your screen? If you have just rededicated your life to the Lord, will you do the exact same thing? Because that's who you are. You are saved. Text saved to one of these two numbers right now. We want to hear from you. We want to encourage you. We want to help you. We are so proud of you taking this time and making this stand in accordance to the living word of God. That's the power of teaching a series or anything from the Bible like this. The word of God will never, ever return void. Miracles always follow the teaching of the word of God. I love you guys so much. I'm so blessed to be your pastor. And I love you. And I'm going to see you in just two hours. Right out behind the church, between the church and the brand new Charlie's house, we are having a drive-through communion service. What are you worried about? Do you have air conditioning? We don't. We'll be under a tent sweating our brains out and not complaining about it because we love you guys so much and we want to serve you God's elements. And we have, I'm never going to lie, we have the nicest and the coolest Father's Day gifts ever given in the history of my ministry, ever. And perhaps the most expensive too. We got a little crazy on the dad's we want to bless you guys with something special for Father's Day because we're not together in the building. We can't have milk and cookies. First time in 15 years, we're not having milk and cookies together. So we got you a really cool gift. Dads, come and get yours. Come be blessed by the pastor as we pray. The pastors pray over your vehicles, over your families. We'll use masks. 
We'll practice safe distancing. We'll protect you guys. God has this. I'll see you in two hours. Love you.